Hello, everybody. Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. My name is Susan Gillis. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the curator of the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. Welcome to our virtual lecture series, Boca History 102. We have muted your microphone, so please do not unmute and uh, don't join with uh, video because we're recording this session. And we're going to provide a link to the recording to all our participants. Now, today I want to share with you some images and stories about how Boca Raton has promoted itself uh, throughout its history. So it's a kind of a, a novel way of looking at Boca Raton history, and I think you're going to get a kick out of it. I call it selling Boca Raton. Now, you will recall um, the original Boca Ratones uh, was located uh, on, on Biscayne Bay, down south. Um, and we know it was a navigational term for a not so navigable inlet. Um, but somehow in the 19th century, the name started being associated with our Lake Boca Raton. And you can see in this map, we're in two places at one time. So despite all the colorful uh, legends about how Boca got its name, they really aren't about our Boca Raton anyway, so they're just that colorful legends. Our place name is a map maker's error. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure you haven't seen this before. Uh, this is really quite interesting. This is a flat for Coconut Park from 1888. So this is before the railroad arrived, before Mr. Rickards comes to town. Uh, and two developers, Field and Osborne, purchase a lot of beach land from Jupiter to Cape Florida. And they filed this plat called Coconut Park, east of Lake Wyman on the beach, where approximately where Red Reef Park is today in that vicinity, section 16. Uh, and it's the most romantic, desirable, and uh, attractive uh, place for invalids, uh, visitors, sportsmen in the U.S., a perfect paradise for winter visitors. Um, they planted, according to the plaque, 13,000 coconut palms. Now, I'm not quite sure what happened to those. Uh, every 20 feet. Uh, and the plaque implies that there's a hotel already built. I'm not sure about that either. Uh, and that's within that red circle at the bottom of the picture. Uh, it also implies that the ground is 25 feet high. Now, there used to be a 10 foot high bluff at the beach, but I'm not so sure about the 25. There's plenty of fishing, which was true, plenty of hunting. Um, and my favorite part, good bathing, meaning swimming, strawberries, watermelons, and vegetables will be grown in the park during the winter. And at upper left in little tiny letters, it says to Boca Tone, B-O-C-A-T-O-N, yet another spelling of our place name. Uh, so but Coconut Park, as far as we know, this never happened. But this is sort of the first promotional material on Boca Raton. Uh, and eventually the property is sold. And then eventually it is developed. Uh, and of course, part of it acquired by the city for our beautiful park. Boca Raton is actually plied in 1896 after Mr. Flagler's railway comes through. And, and it's just a tiny farming town for a couple of decades. So one of our early pioneers was Mr. Harley Gates and he was from Vermont and he was a grower but his genius was real estate. That was his real love. And he actually had a series of tourist cottages he built for snowbirds on Palmetto Park Road. So this is a flyer that he produced, a handbell, in roughly 15. Uh, and you can see he likes to spell Raton with an E. We were a little conflicted about that in the early days. Um, Boca Raton is a bright spot for bright people. It's 15 uh, minutes walk from the beach. It's an hour walk from the Everglades. Um, deer, quail, duck, turkey, wonderful game best fishing on the east coast of Florida, and apparently was very fine. Pineapples, oranges, grapefruit, bananas, lemons, limes, etc. Sweet and Irish potatoes, tomatoes, beans, peppers, lettuce, you name it, all kinds of vegetables. Pure water, good neighbors, low taxes, 
the conveniences of home in the heart of tropical Florida. But the real selling point here is below danger of frost. Because in the 1890s, there were some terrible freezes uh, and they froze the citrus crop as far south as central Florida. So a lot of North Floridians and Georgians were moving all the way into South Florida at this time uh, because we were considered to be below the frost line. And we, we do have a freeze occasionally, but it's very occasional. So this was a great selling feature back in those days. Now here's another fun uh, letter from 1915. Rickards uh, had already moved to North Carolina, but he still owned a lot of property in the area. And his friend George Long becomes his agent, as well as the agent for the model land company, which is basically the railroad. So um, Long is selling property to farmers and investors in the area. And he writes to Rickards in 1915, Deerfield is not in it with the class of people we are getting in. Now that's kind of hilarious. Deerfield was definitely a larger community, quite a bit, uh, but I, I love it because the Boca Ratonians already have a sense of exclusivity. Um, let's go with it. This is from 15 also. And in that year, Dixie Highway was completed through our area. Now Dixie um, was our first interstate and it goes from Sioux St. Marie, Michigan all the way to Miami. Uh, so this was made it possible to come by automobile all, all the way down the peninsula into South Florida. So this was hot stuff, very important in the development of South Florida. And these gentlemen are um, representatives of the community and they are awaiting a motorcade which uh, ran from Delray to Fort Lauderdale to celebrate the grand opening of the highway. Uh, and they are standing at <laughs> Dixie Highway, yes, that's it, uh, at Palmetto Park Road. The view is looking south. And at the time, Dixie was uh, located west of the railroad tracks through the center of town. So a few blocks north of Palmetto, a few blocks south. Uh, in the 20s, it was moved over to the east side. The house it left and, and so on, the packing shed, that's the long property. And I think you can see there are some box cars with materials in them. And that's where the railroad track is. So between the gentleman and that building over on the left uh, is the train itself. And you will notice the banner has no E, so Harley had nothing to do with it. Uh, and it doesn't say um, we have beautiful beaches or we love turtles or come play on our golf courses. No, our seeds are sown because it's still all about farming. Now that's going to change radically in the 20s with the coming of the Florida land boom, which is like a Klondike gold rush. Uh, and into this picture comes this fellow, Addison Meisner. Uh, and he's established himself as the society architect in Palm Beach. He's doing very well for himself, creator of the Palm Beach style. So he decides to get into the real estate development business, buys property in South Boca Raton, and along with his brother, and a bunch of wealthy backers creates the Meisner Development Corporation and the name of their project is Boca Raton. Um, and Meisner's dreams for the community really give us a sense of uniqueness that we cling to today, I'd say, that sets Boca Raton apart from other cities of the Gold Coast because the Boca Raton Meisner project was the most famous and the most infamous of the Florida land boom, a real metaphor for the boom. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, a Meisner development map. Boca Raton had a population of maybe 3,500 and I would push it to 5,000. We don't know, we don't have any solid figures, just newspaper reports. In the mid twenties, it went back to 300 in 1930. Uh, it certainly wasn't the largest city in Florida, but it obviously was the most important as you can see here. Meisner's dream is to create the greatest resort in the world. I am Boca Raton, Florida. A few years hence, there's a little disclaimer. My future must be glorious. I have Addison Meisner to make it so. Meisner wants to create, create the dream city of the Western world with the beauties of an ancient Spanish town, with the amenities of uh, an American capital, uh, with adequate roads and parking and plumbing and, and electricity and so on. Um, and 
the miser's promotion of his project is by implication promoting the whole town of Boca Raton. Uh, they were synonymous at the time. Uh, Miser Development Corporation's publicity machine spent untold amount of money on promoting this project. And uh, I would say they have done the best job of promoting Boca Raton. Uh, it's something we still remember today and talk about today. Uh, we have 90 of these full-size newspaper ads, and there's plenty more that we don't actually have a hard copy of. You can view them on uh, uh, newspapers.com and other sources. Here's a couple you may not have seen. Uh, on the left, in the reverse of the sort of Oregon Trail, uh, we have the 1920s equivalent of covered wagon heading southeast down the peninsula of Florida to Boca Raton. Uh, and on the right, we have a little snob appeal uh, because we want all you Long Islanders, you yachtsmen in Long Island to come down south to enjoy the winter at Boca. We have a couple of uh, promotional brochures from the Boca Raton project. This is my favorite because it features um, photographs uh, of actual places. Now you can see they appear to be illustrations, but they are based on photos. Uh, today, we would say they've been photoshopped, but we know they didn't have that back then, but they had the 20s equivalent. Uh, but they are based on actual photos and they feature a house in Spanish village, Floresta, um, Camino Real, the ad building, the Cloister Inn. And that's why I find it so interesting. The hotel opens in February of 26, uh, and now it's going to bear the brunt of promoting Boca Raton. Um, this is a billboard that sat, it has to have been Dixie Highway, there was no federal, southbound somewhere in town. Um, and uh, in addition to articles and uh, um, photographs and so on of the grand opening of the hotel, every time a celebrity or a socialite stayed there, you know, that was worthy of a column. So uh, we're trying to keep this whole Boca Raton project alive and they cloister in is taking very much the brunt of that publicity. And you can see the cloister appears on the two brochures here. Now, meanwhile, Miser has competition in town uh, and they too do their part to promote Boca Raton because they're promoting their specific project. Here's Boca Raton Park. Uh, and it claims to be in the center of Boca Raton, but we know it was actually a sort of military and glades, uh, which may be in the heart of Boca Raton, in the center of Boca Raton uh, today, but it kind of wasn't back then. <laughs> that was really far afield. Um, and um, Boca Raton Park is happy to imply that Meisner is involved. It says here, Platt approved by Addison Meisner. Now he was briefly our city planner. That was an actual position. Uh, and he may actually have looked at this plaque, but other than that, we believe he had nothing whatsoever to do with the Boca Raton Park development. But everyone was very eager to um, uh, hang on to his coattails. They were happy to imply that Meisner was involved because he had that wonderful name recognition at the time. Uh, here's another promotion of Boca Raton, Boca Vista, the highlands of Boca Raton. The plat was filed in October 25. Now, this is kind of funny. So I look up the plat. I have a copy of plat book. And sure enough, Boca Vista was platted in 25. Um, and it still exists as a neighborhood today. But look where it is. West of Boca Tica, north of Yamato, east of the interstate. That In those days, that was north of the Yamato colony. So that was really Boca Raton at all. But that's what we're selling here. We're the highlands of Boca Raton. Highest ground in the city, one and one third mile from the ocean. Here's a couple of more uh, competitors from that time, Boca Raton Heights, which is just west of the railroad tracks, and Croissantania, which claims to be at Boca Raton. And it also uses Meisner's name quite a bit. Um, we're right you know, adjacent the Meisner Development Project. Now, whoop. Preview. <laughs> um, you all are probably familiar, this is one of my favorite posters, and it was published in 25, predicting Boca Raton's future, future in 1927. 
I am Boca Raton. I was a beautiful landscape. Important men saw me, surveyed me, plighted me. Then came nature's beauty. Doctors such as landscape architects, uh, landscape artists, builders, artisans, architects, and they changed me. Majestic boulevards traversed my bosom, etc. And down at the bottom, it has my great quote, I am the rendezvous of the rich. Each passing day sees a new era in my existence. I am the dream of a genius, the materialization of a magical mirage. I am the sun porch of America. I am Boca Raton in 1927. What city could ask for better publicity? But alas, it was not to be because the boom has gone bust. Uh, really by 1926. Um, for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which is a terrible Cat 4 storm that hits Miami and Fort Lauderdale in September of that year. It does do damage to Boca Raton, um, but the point is that uh, anybody who could get out of town did, anybody who was planning to come south did not. So the depression really comes years early and construction really slows to a crawl, not completely uh, done, but slows to a crawl. Then in 28, we get another horrible storm that hits West Palm, goes inland, drowns 3,000 people around Lake Okeechobee. Uh, and the photographs you see here are the damage to Boca Raton specifically from the 28 storm. It was much worse than the September 26 storm. So this is a very interesting little promotional flyer. Uh, that I judge to be from either early 28 or late 27. And that's based on the context. It mentions the 26 hurricane. It mentions the arrival of the Seaboard Railroad, which we know came in January 27. It does not mention the 28th storm. Uh, and it's very curious. Number one, there's a picture of the Cloister Inn on the front, which by, um, you know, 28 would have been closed. Um, but look at the slogan. What an unusual promotional slogan. An event of permanence in the history of Florida. Why? Because Boca Raton's trying to assure everybody that, hey, we survived the 26th storm, we've survived economic downturn, uh, and we are still here, despite many boom era developments that either never made it off paper, evaporated, or got absorbed by their larger neighbors. We are still here. Now, in 27, Miser Development is bankrupt, and Mr. Geis, one of the original investors, acquires the assets uh, of Miser Development. Uh, he hires Schultz and Weaver, famous architects, to triple the size of the Cloister Inn, which opens at the Boca Raton Club in 1930, January of 1930. Um, and the Portion of this image within that yellow oval, that is the cloister inn. That's Mr. Meisner's part of the hotel. The rest collectively, including the pool, is the club. Now, the Boca Raton Club becomes a major economic engine of the community. We're still farming, but it also is going to bear the brunt of promote, promoting Boca Raton because it's the only agency that has any money at this point. Uh, and the club in the 30s is very exclusive very private. Uh, even more, it's still a private um, hotel. You can't just walk in there and have a cup of coffee and check things out. Uh, but back then, very much so, you know, no television, no social media, no internet, etc. cetera. Um, and the exclusivity and the fact it was off the beaten track was a selling feature for its patrons. These are people who did not want to be seen, who really wanted to get away from it all. Uh, and so Boca Raton in this era is Florida's secret paradise, meaning basically the hotel is Florida's secret paradise. Well, that's going to change radically in the 40s with the coming of World War II and the Boca Raton Army Airfield. Um, and it takes over town. Um, and uh, it, even though it was a radar train base and radar was still top secret during the war, the base itself is not top secret. It's a huge base, almost 6,000 acres. Uh, everybody, there are military bases all over South Florida, uh, but everyone is aware of Boca Raton Field. Um, and it's a great boon to the economy. As many as 50 to 100,000 men stationed here between 42 and 47 in a town of 750 people. You didn't have to advertise the field. Everybody knew it was here. Um, and 
the uh, every citizen was impacted by this because, of course, the local businesses and there are only a handful do uh, uh, booming business. Um, they everybody with an available room in town uh, rents out their house to boarders, people who are uh, civilian employees at the base or the families of soldiers and what have you. So everyone profits from the presence of the field. We know the base extended from uh, Palmetto on the south to north of Yamato and from the FEC tracks on the east to the what today are Amtrak tracks on the west. Uh, the main gate was roughly Northwest 4th Avenue uh, Palmetto Park Road. Uh, and the emblem of the base, the mascot of the base was a pelican. Operations continue to 47 when most operations and personnel are transferred to Keesler Field in Biloxi. So that was a bit of blow to the community financially. But in the late 40s and 50s, now we have another boom in Florida, a post-war land boom. And a lot of those soldiers from Minnesota and Montana who were stationed in Florida in the winter months at least, say, oh boy, we're gonna live in Florida and they return with their new young families in tow. Uh, and Boca Raton benefits from that as well as every other community. Federal Highway was widened in the late 40s from two to four lanes uh, and it quickly becomes the main drag through town and there's new businesses, new service agencies, new restaurants and so on. This photo is from 1955 and it's taken from roughly Southeast first um, street. The traffic light is at Palmetto. Remember, the first street south of Palmetto Park Road is actually Royal Palm Road. The second street south of Palmetto is first. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that, by the way. 51, our new Chamber of Commerce is formed, organized. And in 53, they get this peculiar little, uh, looks like half of a trailer across the street from Town Hall. And now the chamber takes on the task of promoting Boca Raton for the next several decades. And you can see the members sort of lying in wait for any prospective tourists or investors, maybe new businesses to the area. This is a brochure by the chamber in 54. And I think it's a lot of fun. Most people don't have air conditioning at this point. Uh, instead, the selling feature is our natural climate and how pleasant it is. And according to this chart, uh, Boca has six days or less per year in which the temperature reaches 90 or above. What happened, right? Uh, which ranks it below major cities such as Chicago, Boston, and New York. Well, <laughs> so that was probably true. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. We built a bunch of high rises on the beach to block the breeze and we poured concrete and asphalt all over everything. So now we're in a nice big oven. That's what happened. Also in the 50s, you start to see uh, the snowbird slash retiree phenomenon. Uh, and we have ads, the one on the left is for a co-op, remember co-ops before condominiums, uh, clearly appealing to more senior residents senior residents with money. Um, and the little ad from 54 um, features a couple uh, and, and they know they can live longer, live better at Boca Raton. We had a couple of tourist attractions in the 50s that bring people to town. One is Ancient America, which is a pre-Columbian burial mound north of Yamato, east of Federal Highway, uh, which operated in the mid 50s and Africa USA down about where the Camino Gardens neighborhood is today was very successful, it was a safari park. So successful that it appeared on the cover of Life Magazine in 1960. And so for Little Boca Raton to appear on the cover of Life Magazine, which was sort of the ultimate uh, American magazine, uh, many, many, many people had subscription to Life. That was really hot stuff. Here's a chamber brochure from 57, look at that wide open beach. What happened to that too, right? And notice we are a perfect blend of past and future. And I find this continually up to this day, uh, a reference to that. They're, they're talking about the glory days, the dreams of the 1920s, the Meisner era. 
And 58 were the different Florida community. I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, from 700 to 7,000 in seven years. That's almost correct because I know we went from uh, just under 1,000 in 50 to just under 7,000 in 60. And then in 70, it's 28,500. And then it gets silly after that. Uh, and you can see all these new mid-century modern style properties springing up in town. Uh, in 60, we're still, we're in the setting of sheer beauty. Uh, Boca Raton is a community with a glamorous past, a beautiful present and a brilliant future. The climate in Boca Raton is near perfect throughout the year. So we're still, uh, uh, air conditioning still not a regular um, a commodity that people have. Um, and it wasn't until, until really the mid to late 60s where central air becomes standard in condominiums and houses and so on. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I included this little advertisement for you for air conditioners from uh, the early 60s. Uh, and I did a little research. So it turns out a dollar in 1960 is today worth $8.88, which means that $139 air conditioner is over 1200 bucks. And of course, uh, you don't have just one, you have one in every room, all you youngsters who don't know about that stuff. This beautiful 60s ad uh, is actually the inside cover of a brochure for Camino Gardens from the mid 60s. And you can see we're appealing to families now, full-time residents. Uh, we have kids playing with mom at the beach. You can go um, golfing and fishing. You have a barbecue with your neighbors, You cultural activities, polo, churches, uh, even be a member of the hotel. Come to Bogotá to live full time. 62, the chamber is promoting what we know is coming. Um, FAU's been um, begun, is under construction, and we know that it's going to be a very, very big draw for the community. So FAU becomes the promoter of Bogotá. It will bring not only faculty and students, but all the support staff um, and um, uh, uh, businesses that want to be associated with the university, particularly one interested in science and technology and math, uh, as everything was, we were in the middle of the space race in those days. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, uh, Mr. Schein owns the hotel in the 40s and 50s, uh, and he begins the transition of the hotel from a seasonal social hotel to a full-time conventional hotel. Uh, Mr. Davis acquires a hotel in 56 and creates Arvida, uh, which stands for Arthur Vining Davis. And Arvida continues the morphing of the hotel, adding the tower uh, in the late 60s, as well as the Great Hall Convention Center to accommodate these conventions. Um, and again, the hotel is very much promoting the community um, with their own promotions and their big uh, uh, marketing budget <laughs> um, and uh, um, changes the face of the hotel very much and changes the face of the community. Meanwhile, there's a little bit of kickback. So not everybody is into all this growth. And in 72, our citizens pass a uh, referendum for a growth cap of 40,000 residential units, not people residential unit. Now this is struck down by the courts and the city fights valiantly on, but eventually gives up. Uh, but by 79, we get a land use plan that actually places density ceilings uh, on properties in the city. Now, this is not an issue that has gone away. Think of the last 10 years and the growth of downtown Boca Raton. So still a controversial issue. But the point I'm making here is the growth cap created some rather negative publicity for the community. So in this infamous article from 73, the New York Times says, rich Boca Raton decides it's time to stop growing. Thank you so much. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's true or not because the New York Times has said it and that's in the back of everybody's brain. Plus there's the picture of a gentleman selling champagne from an ice cream cart at the Polo Grounds. So the snooty patootie attitude of Boca Ratonians are sealed whether it's true or not. So we decided to go with it. So in 77, there's this amusing article. Um, you can't buy a used car in Boca Raton. Well, that's not really true. Uh, you can't have open air car lots because they're tacky. 
Don't look for the crowds. I don't have an answer to that. What happened? What the millionaires left us. So we're still talking about the dream of the 20s that was so glorious. We have a polo field. Not every town has a polo field. Uh, I love this. Um, uh, well, first of all, no McDonald's arches. Okay, again, tacky. Um, I believe Aspen, Colorado has the same all. All right. But this is fun. The heritage, architecture, and natural beauty of this town are guarded like national treasures. Really? Uh, as the principal proponent of historic preservation in the community, I want to know what happened to that. But the guarantee of a lifetime, um, the beauty of living in Boca won't change for two reasons. First is because of the attitude of the people here. And second, because of a company called Arvida. Now, Arvida is not the only developer in town. We know this very well, but she's the big gal. She's the one with the big bucks. So Arvida now bears the brunt of promoting Boca Raton and real estate is king. Arvida introduces the gated community, Royal Palm Young Country Club, Estancia, Timber Creek, Paseo, um, Arvida Park of Commerce, on and on. And uh, they have the money to promote coming to Boca Raton. Uh, Boca Raton proper within the city limits as well as West Boca. Meanwhile, in the late 60s, IBM brings a manufacturing plant to town uh, and it's here in the 80s and 81 that the PC, IBM's foray into the personal computer market is manufactured and introduced to the world, the ancestor of all PC style computers. Uh, and it is very, very successful. Uh, it attracts clones, uh, but it also attracts all sorts of high tech industries and Boca Raton becomes uh, for a while a Silicon Beach, particularly at the Arvida Park of Commerce. Meanwhile, um, in 1980, Town Center Mall opens nowhere near the center of town uh, and it draws a lot of retail away from downtown. So downtown's looking kind of derelict, a lot of empty storefronts by 80. Then the community redevelopment agency is created to combat this. Uh, and one of the first sanctioned projects uh, for the CRA is actually the restoration of Town Hall in the early 1980s. Here's a fun article by Rig Hill, 1986, when we were still pink. Imagine a city so special, so neat, babies can't be born in our hospital. Well, we didn't have a maternity ward back then. Uh, no use car lots. A city whose residents care whether they live in Boca Raton or at Tobago Raton. Now, I've never heard this before or since, but I think that means you're in the city limits or in West Boca. If you know differently, you email me about that, okay? Uh, and to your right, there's a little um, stab at Palm Beach uh, because we have the things that the generations before had, um, but one more thing more, opportunity for those not born into wealth to come here and make money. <laughs> so in Palm Beach, you already have money. In Boca Raton, you have opportunity to make money. Uh, another CRA sanctioned project, Miser Park opens in 91, and Miser Park is going to bear a lot of the fun of advertising, Boca, promoting Boca Raton. It gets a lot of press, a lot of play in the papers and magazines continuously throughout this time. And to further promote Miser Park, uh, we, the International Museum of Cartoon Art opens in 96 at the South End. Uh, and in 2001, the Boca Raton Museum Art brings their art museum to the northern end of Meisner Park, also promoting our community. This is from 95. From the dance of the Royal Palms and the Gulf Stream Breeze to bustling Fortune 500 businesses to world-class golf reef courses and five-star restaurants, Boca Raton has the best of everything. Well, we'll just, why not claim all of it? Uh, and we're still rolling with that. Uh, this is a, a bumper sticker from 2019 by the Office of Economic Development that's doing a lot of promoting of our community today. Uh, and it's in 21st century speak, good, better, Okay. So that sums it up. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, next week, um, Patricia is going to be um, talking to you again, and we're going to be sharing storm stories, which is uh, sort of the history of hurricanes in Boca Raton. Thank you all for joining us today.